You know the one thing we did right was the day we started to fight. Keep your eye on the prize. Oh Lord, oh Lord, keep your eye on the prize. Oh Lord, oh Lord, you know the one thing we did right was the day we started to fight. Keep your eye on the prize. Oh, Lord. Listen, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you. I think everybody under the sound of my voice should get something from the consequences of our behavior. Because we're killing ourselves not only as a family of humanity. We're killing the planet. And we're making ourselves very vulnerable to extinction. Okay. Gino Vanelli said, uh, if God is good, then God is cruel. Take back the world you've granted the food and salvage the land that is best without man and all his greed. One of my favorite favorite songs. Thank you, Gino. Thank you for that those beautiful lyrics. But this right here is some real serious mental information. And y'all know this is the mental house where we deal with this. We deal with our personal. We deal with our community, our, our family. Trump. And since Europe, this, this article um, was actually taken, um, you know, done by Char Newton, clinical professor at North Dakota University. Since European expansion into the Americas, white people have demonized black people, have demonized us, and portrayed them as undesirable, violent, and hypersexual. Originally, this intent the intent of this demonization was to legitimize the conquest and sale of African people. The consequence of this negative portrayal has been documented and the psychological impact that it has had on black people themselves is horrendous. It includes self-hatred and this is when y'all uh, crazy white people start talking about, well, what about Chicago? What about Chicago? That's part of it. And I also want to throw this little tidbit bit in there. Allegedly. A lot of these shootings and stuff that they say they don't have no identified person is people that we trust as law enforcement. They, they doing the shooting. They are actually going up and down the streets as if they're playing video games and taking hits out on us. As I don't, A lot of them are some of those soldiers from uh, Israeli soldiers, allegedly. I've been hearing all kinds of crazy stuff on these streets. So it's really important that you realize that no, really nobody like us. And they can get anybody to treat us negatively only and project what they feel about themselves on us because we are a great people. We are ordinate, great, the mothers and fathers of all living things. And if they can get you to hate yourself and think that you're nothing and internalize the racism, they know that that's going to erode your uh, black consciousness. They already know that that's going to help have you destruct from the inside out. You don't need nobody to, take, to do nothing to you because you're going to do it to yourself. These white people are masters at technology 
they are masters at uh, doing experiment on what makes people tick, black and white. The system is extremely corrupt, and the minute we realize that there's a lot of enemies that will have us doing things that are not in our own self-interest. That's the worst part about the damn shit. That's how you know you brainwashed. Stockholm Syndrome type. During the 1960s, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. recognized the consequences of racist stereotypes. He tried to change the language and the symbols of racism. Somebody told a lie one day, King said. They couched it in a language. They made everything black, ugly, and evil. Look in your dictionary. And you see the synonyms of the word black. It's always something degrading and low and sinister. And look at the word white. It's always something pure. I mean, just look at that madness and a, a, a insecure, psychotic mindset that will put that trope on. Put that for their own greed and purposes. And want to know why a lot of black people don't want to just mess with y'all. Because not only did it happen, y'all don't want to fix it and you deny it. And then it's up now where you got people like Ron DeSantis and people making a living off of our misery that they are indoctrinating us and pushing on us. Though King longed for the day when the word black would be associated with beauty, black people are still coping with feelings of alienation as a result of what is known as racialized trauma. The emotional impact of racism, racial discrimination, and violence on mostly black people. It's a hell of a uh, way to live. Um, and this person said, uh, I am a psychologist and professor of counseling. In our 2022 peer-reviewed article, mental health counselor Janae Steele said she did detail the mental injuries caused by encounters with racial bias, hostility, discrimination, and harassment. More important, our research has shown that healing from racialized trauma can help reduce the negative impacts of racism and provide the emotional resources necessary to challenge racial injustices. Once you understand who you are and who they are, the elite, the elite the one who created the madness. Once you realize that, once you get a good grasp on that, you won't be out here performing like an idiot. You, would, you wouldn't just run up in your brother's and your sister's house with battle rams and shoot everybody in the house. You couldn't do it because you would see your brother as you see yourself. You would love him as you love yourself. Y'all check this out. Let me... Nobody can let me let me check this out. Just 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 listen to this. I want y'all to hear this. Hold on one minute. Hold on. Okay, here we go. But discussing psychological well-being can still be a tough conversation to have, particularly for black men. And joining us to shed more light on this topic is Jamal Miller from Mercy Medical Group. Thank you so much for joining us again. Yeah, glad to be here. This is such an important conversation to have. Yeah. Historically, what has been the mental health stigma within the black community? Let's start there. Yeah, well, um, you have no health without mental health. Um, and, you know, when we think about stigma from a cultural standpoint, especially for men, um, how we often grew up, whether we're your baby boomer, Gen X, or millennial, oftentimes masculinity is defined in a certain way. And oftentimes we don't see strength and vulnerability. 
um, and being vulnerable oftentimes when you're experiencing a mental or behavioral health challenge, um, it's essential to get to a place of, of healing. And, you know, professionally and academically, you know, I've studied uh, to become the healthcare administrator that I am, but it wasn't until personally I started to experience mental and behavioral health issues. And once it's personal, um, you understand the importance of overcoming stigma and acknowledging that uh, when you experience something or if you see something, uh, acknowledging that you may not be well or something is off um, yeah. it is okay. Um, and, and that's where strength and vulnerability, specifically an article that I just wrote, um, is key. Um, and that's, you know, initially how I think about it. Yeah. So how do you shift the narrative and make it okay, especially within a culture that maybe had stigmatized, uh, mental health as maybe even characterizing it as, as weak, weakness, asking for help? For sure. It's like a exercise, you know, you get, you know, stronger uh, by exercising certain muscles in your body. Yeah. So, you know, our brain is a very real organ, yet it's very it's physical. A lot of times when we think about our mental and behavioral health is something lofty or disconnected. Mm -hmm. But from a biochemical standpoint, you know, our mental and behavioral health disposition is affected in one way or the other. You know, one of my experiences uh, years ago was learning that I had a vitamin D deficiency and learning that the symptoms of that could potentially be depression or a number of other challenges that we experience. It's so... Oftentimes, it's mysterious when we start to feel different and we can't really pinpoint. But once you pinpoint exactly what that issue is, when you go to your primary care doctor or your therapist and they can diagnose you uh, with exactly what is going on, you can put together a plan to get back on top, to feel better in mind, body, uh, and spirit. But it was that personal experience that helped me um, understand and appreciate that it's okay to find strength and vulnerability, um, but you just got to say something sometimes. Yeah. Have you found that representation also within cultures and communities has also played a, a part in just getting that message out there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there are studies that show, particularly in medicine, when you think about uh, physicians or nurses or other uh, areas uh, of practice clinically, yeah. That when you have by gender, race, ethnicity, a provider of care that looks like you, who practices more culturally competent and congruent care, is positively associated with better outcomes. You often can speak the same language, share similar lived experiences, and when you establish that bond of trust, it positions a strong foundation upon which you can build. So that representation is key in clinical settings, um, particularly when we think about healthcare. But also in the non-clinical setting, you know, in my career, there are a number of people who inspired me um, by way of, you know, them looking like me, taking time as a youth to share with me um, that I can be them one day. Um, and uh, so representation, when we think about the importance of diversity, inclusion and belonging is extremely important. Such a very important topic to, to talk about and just put out there. Hopefully someone who might see this will reach out to whether it's you yeah. or another healthcare professional to discuss anything. Jamal, we thank you so much for your time this morning. We really thank appreciate you. it. And a reminder. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I'm glad the brother uh, is able to talk about uh, his personal mental health situation. I just wish more people would be more honest and begin to deal with the trauma that we have, whether it's in church, whether it's from church, rather I should say, school, our families, uh, we have to deal with society as a whole, trying to make you feel less than when you look at them and know that, that who put you in charge? You dumb, never mind. Those are real, real life thoughts. Uh, dynamics, how white folks think that they know everything and we don't know anything when we know more than them. That's why you, you know, and then you look at a, a, a group of people that would have you nurse their babies at their, your breast. You so lazy, you didn't lay it up and open both draw legs and had a baby. And you so trifling, somebody else got to take it and feed it. Just think about that for a minute. And yet this same person turn around and call you lazy and how you ain't shit. The whole dynamic 
of the whole slavery mindset and the narcissistic behavior of white people uh, is really going to destroy this country. It's going to destroy, actually, um, the world if the indigenous people don't realize just how important this is to put uh, certain aspects of reality back to where it should be. Now you can take that any way you want to. Um, but for them to have constructed this world with this racism, the way it is, this ugliness, this filthiness where you have black people turning on their own self. A uh, 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 massa, uh, uh, uh. let me tell you what so and so did. A uh, uh, massa, uh, uh. it's like, what the hell? Have, what kind of mind screw has been put on us? Anyway, um, more important. Uh, research has shown that healing from racial trauma again can help reduce negative impacts on of racism. An American, the American Psychological Association defines trauma as any disturbing experience that results in significant fear, helplessness, disassociation, confusion, or other disruptive feelings intense enough to have a long-lasting negative effect on the person's attitude, behavior, and other aspects of function. So that's trauma. A lot of us have been traumatized by our relationships, and we don't know. And we keep experiencing the same result because our grid is set for this type of trauma. Oh, come on up here, somebody. Let me... <sighs> Common ways people are exposed to racializing trauma include everyday slights, such as a store owner following a person around the damn store, racial slurs, denied opportunities, racial profiling, and hate crimes. These encounters, known as race based events, may occur directly between individual or groups of people, or they may happen indirectly. For example, as a result of watching a video of police brutality. How many times are we traumatized? That's why I don't even like to watch them. And people say, well, you got to see it. You got to. No, I don't. At this age, my job is to, is to keep my heart and my blood pressure down. Okay, so I have to understand that this is a young man's game. They got the energy. We supposed to have the guidance. But there's been such a disconnect that we cannot hook the train up to the track. Anyway, um, whether they occur directly or indirectly, race-based events have a negative psychological effect of, on people of color and often leave them feeling wounded. Some of these wounds include increased rates of hypervigilance, depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, and low self-esteem. And, and just think, they know it because they created it. They, they know damn well they wouldn't want to be treated the way you are treated in this society. Jane Elliott talked to tell us, you know, did that. She went straight to the heart of it. How many of y'all no black people are being treated bad in this society. The whole auditorium raised their hand. Whole auditorium. Now, how many of y'all will trade places with them? Nobody. You say, okay, so you know what's going on. You know it's wrong. But you're complicit. You don't mind black people getting beat up and, this, and somehow it's feeding some kind of racist trope inside of you. Some wounds, you know, cut too deep. And people go to their grave with this hatred towards y'all. And they don't have to make no excuse why they hate white people. They've seen their uncles, their brothers, 
uh, disrespected, killed, shot. They've seen a government who has turned their back on them. They've seen uh, a, a police department who are roll, roll and rule our neighborhoods like an occupied force. And so there are a lot of people who are objective enough to say, you know, I know that there's problems in this society. And, you know, we only going to be able to solve them if we work together. But a lot of people have been burnt on that ideology so much that they don't, they don't even want to deal with it. And that's sad. Anyway, during the research, we interviewed a 29-year-old black woman who grew up in a lower middle-class neighborhood in, near Detroit. She had attended a predominantly white private school and went on to become the first in her family to graduate college and later earn a master's degree in counseling. Okay. But when she started her first full-time job, she noticed that it was dominated by white males in a work environment where the voices of people of color were not even regularly heard. For instance, the woman told us that during a staff meeting, she was often ignored except on rare occasions when issues of race were discussed. As a result, the woman explained that she felt she was devalued and began to feel anxious, sad, and hopeless. Her self-esteem had also suffered. See, on the streets, they call them mind games. How to heal. Healing from racial trauma, uh, racialized trauma is possible. Now, y'all know next month, a whole month, October, oh, well, I like to say mental health month, but it was mental health week. So during current incidents of social injustice combined with centuries of violence, poverty, undereducation, mass incarceration, family dysfunction, and health disparities have made it difficult for some black people to maintain hope, a necessary element in undertaking the work to overcome this trauma. Nevertheless, by learning new ways of thinking and coping, it is possible to find hope and to overcome the wounds of this horrible scourge on humanity of racialized trauma. Based on research and nearly 20 years of clinical experience, we have found ways, uh, we have found tangible tools to address these wounds in five holistic ways. As we write in Black Lives Are Beautiful, the first step is identifying and understanding the psychological impact of racial trauma, as well as knowledge of strategies for wellness. Second step in healing is active promotion and higher self-esteem. Our research, in our research, we learned that affirming one's personal strengths and replacing it. Um, the negative beliefs can help individuals deal with racialized trauma. The third is developing resilience. Tenacity is very important during adversity. The ability to bounce back and preserve can come from connecting with individuals, family, and the community. And don't forget your powerful, powerful ancestors. We are spiritual people. We have made, been made to assimilate into a society that don't respect us and took and tried to kill our pineal gland at every chance. Dully. We have to get back to our power. For some black people, this work is especially powerful, as research indicates. That spending time engaged in activities that focus on cultural strengths can also increase feelings of personal control and, and lead to um, higher self-esteem. And the fourth way is to promote empowerment. 
Finding strength in one's personal choices is fundamental to achieving a higher self-image. Those choices could include supporting black-owned businesses, attending cultural events, developing a strategy to gain financial independence, which I think is one of the most important. Um, the last way of healing is found in promoting a sense of community. By doing so, an individual can increase a sense of belonging and encounter the feelings of isolation triggered by racialized trauma. Um, I really want to thank the conversation uh, for sharing this article. Because as you can see, as a society, we got some work to do. And more specifically, as black folk, we really got some work to do. All right? And so this is what I want to hear. Uh, Calling out around the world, are you ready for a brand new me? <laughs> Summer's here and the time is right for dancing in the street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll see y'all in the next video. Hey, listen, if you like what you hear, please subscribe and share the channel. Hit the like button. Hit the like button, hit the like button, hit the like button. Leave me your comment on what you think about this article. What you think about this? You think it's important to have a sense of cultural strength in spite of all? That don't mean you got to hate nobody. It just means you got to have some self-love in order to stop a lot of this madness that we see. And you got to be willing to step outside yourself and, and do the right thing. Be accountable and responsible. So with that being said, if you like what you hear, please share the channel. And I'll see you in the next video.